yeah, glad to be here and be able to speak about a topic that is pretty, yeah, I think pretty important for D in the future. Um, we're going to make a small detour first um, because I want to talk a bit about libraries and ecosystems in general. Um, then, well, we'll directly dive into working with databases and how, well, we'll get to that. So, um, the DAP packages are like extremely useful. They've been so, so like the quality improved so much over the past years. You can, like three years ago, if you wanted to do some real work with D, you really had to write everything yourself, more or less. And I think it's kind of really established in the community that everybody starts their own small projects and whenever they want to do something, they're just building up everything from their self, for themselves. And that might be, might be a good approach for like a student product or having fun or just enjoying programming. It might also work for a bigger company which can spend money on 10 developers and like write really serious software with something. That makes totally sense to write everything yourself. But if you're just like a few people and you want to get something done, you want to write a web application, you want to write, I don't know, a network application, a maybe even a GUI application, um, though this went somewhat out of fashion. But if you just want to do something like that, then it's really hard if you have to do everything yourself. And it's really amazing how much, how much you can find on, on DAP nowadays. So there's like so many packages for every database driver. There's a native driver. There's really plenty of good stuff there. Although we still have to improve the website a lot to make it more searchable and to find, find the right and good packages and yeah, to differentiate there. But really the key thing here is the network effect really works there. We have like 750 packages by now and it's like somebody puts up some work, a hundred other people can use it or a thousand other people. It's like really enabling for writing complex applications. Mm, well, then again, well, it, it kind of relates back to this. Everybody makes like DIY programming, right? You just write everything yourself until you have your application. But in some areas, competition is a really inefficient way to actually achieve something. So just think of, yeah, I don't know, just think of two web application frameworks, like something WebD, or we, we actually had this in a presentation yesterday. So there's WebD, there are other servers. Nowadays, people more use uh, WebD or something. But in order to compete, you really need two full-blown libraries. So it's like a dozen of authors, authors writing two full scale libraries with all the documentation, all the brittle thing, or if it's small things, it's just two authors. And mm, well, that's really a huge waste of talent and effort to do so much stuff and if it either ends up the same or if just like is a very minor difference between the two libraries, then well, it doesn't add too much value that people are really competing there. And I think it would be great if more people collaborate on topics if they want to achieve something. It's very easy to find like-minded people in, in the community. You just, uh, I don't know, I wanted to write a new I.O. library. Somebody already wrote an I.O. package. You go there and um, go on the GitHub page and, I don't know, comment on his commits and say, like, I have a better idea for this or that. Or, well, you, you get into touch speak to people and um, they pick up ideas. You can achieve so much more. So I'm really glad to see how this D-Science organization was founded and how like five people are working on lots of very important numerical libraries and that's really had like so much more momentum. They are capable of maintaining the whole library ecosystem much better and well, it's really amazing. And so find, find the right people, collaborate, do some great stuff. Then the other thing is there's a, there's a lot of ecosystems out there already. So there's like lots of services that have a mixed business model where you either pay for private repos or you can use them for free for public repos, right? So GitHub, obviously, but there's a lot of CI integration services. There's tools for linting your code. There's tools for doing, well, there's 
there's just many projects. There's a lot of databases, and each of them has like a list of supported languages. And I think these shouldn't be in every of those lists, like on every of those lists in the internet. Um, maybe not the complete internet, but like really in many of those. Um, basically, like adding these support is often a very small thing, but also enables a huge thing. So for example, like the Travis CI script was actually not that simple, but it's like it's some effort. It took maybe one day to write in D support for Travis CI, and now, I don't know, half, half of the DAP packages are actually using this as a testing and uh, continuous integration service. Um, we have some coverage results. We, you can actually upload like DMD coverage output to some web page and get like a nicely printed vision and have integration with, with GitHub. So you see if your coverage goes down, or if some pull request brings your coverage really down, and then you can uh, easily integrate it. It's, it's also some very nice publicity to have a good project and have D support on that web page. So that's really good. I don't know, like protocol buffers, like on the official side, side people go there, I see there's D support. Great. Some people might never have heard of D and they're like, what, what's this? That's really, um, that's really a good way to get um, publicity. And well, just one idea, right? There's this nice project by Brian Schultz, DScanner, and somebody could write an engine for code climate, just for example. I think it would be fairly, a fairly reasonable effort. Mm. Oh. So to start with the real talk, um, I want to tell a small anecdote, which was me trying to write a small web application in order to query, like, we have a, at workplace, we have a small metric database that collects information about our servers, about our application and whatnot. And there was no, no good alerting solution for that uh, metric database called Graphite, actually. I mean, there's plenty of alerting solutions. I tried out a few, and they're all very crappy. So I decided to write a simple application because the task was about, like, well, you query a JSON API, you look at the data values, and then you write an email to somebody. It's like really simple thing. And I said, yeah, okay, it would be great if there's a, like a nicer web front end, so you can actually add new checks very easily. You can add new recipients easily. You can, uh, you can do a few things, have a nice graph where you see the threshold and whatnot. Um, well, there's a link. You can click on it. So it's, it's a nifty, nice, small tool. Um, so I thought it would take like maybe one or two days to write this. It was also the first Angular 2 app I wrote, so I was like, okay, maybe rather two days, so you actually learn how to use this framework. Um, turned out it was a bit of a hassle to get the build system of JavaScript running. It's a bit uh, confusing the situation there. Uh, <laughs> somebody knows this, it's like, well, they are, they are figured it out at some point. But in the end, it's a nice framework, and it was really, don't touch the mouse. <laughs> and in the end, it's, well, thanks to 5D, it's really simple to write a nice REST API for your simple queries and then just have Angular sitting doing the front end stuff. Well, the problem started when I thought like, okay, where to store all the check informations on all the recipients and whatnot. There's like, you could do some basic serialization on this, but why not use SQLite, which is like, totally appropriate for the job, right? So you have like maybe two tables, one table with all the checks and then another table with all the recipients that should receive a mail or some other sort of notification for a certain check. Um, well, and then I actually spent about a whole day trying out various existing object relational mappers because writing pure SQL spread along your code is like really annoying and writing lots of functions to insert simple data structures into SQL is not really that much fun. Um, and and I, found, I found a really huge amount of good efforts of like people trying to write nice frameworks. Um, there's Hibernate D, which tries to emulate what Hibernate and Java does. Um, there's, I think, Sönke wrote one, which is called Dotter, was, was a very experimental stage. Still, so it's also like 
a bit usable. It had an in-memory driver and some, I also think, a MongoDB driver, if I'm right. Yeah. Um, there was Dworm, which was another approach. And all of them were quite nice, but I, and, and I found something while researching yesterday. There's something called quill.d or something. Uh, I just found it yesterday. I didn't try it. It looks, I think, I think it comes closest to what I had in mind. So there's something I have in mind for the past few years already. And I was actually waiting for somebody to write it, but it never happened. And now I realize I might need to talk about this to happen. <laughs> Um, so in the end, I used um, a nice SQLite wrapper where you can just nicely execute statements and whatnot, and wrote like 200 lines wrapper around insert, find, give me everything, and uh, remove something myself. And well, this was like 200 lines of code in the 600 lines of code project, like totally out of scope, so to say. That's um, yeah. So that's the motivation for actually giving the talk. It also goes back to this collaboration thing. So I think we should try to collaborate on writing a really nice database framework in D because it's, well, because I think it's really possible to write really good stuff. Um, If I remember correctly, there was a talk about in the last deconf about an or well, did you try collaborating with him? Um, I'm not sure who. Who was it? I, I have like a vague recollection. Maybe it's the writer of Quill. Maybe um, if somebody knows that. But I figured that I, I definitely decided yesterday that I should try to work with him because he's really close to what what I want. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, but basically there, there have been several ideas floating around the past few years. Um, everybody has its own attempt on that. There was like, you know, there's like pl plenty, plenty people tried it out. Um, we had a very long discussion about using expression templates to, for querying and even there it turned out a lot of people tried this and it has certain issues. We also figured out at some point, somebody asked on the forum, we figured out a very nice thing. We can do amazing optimizations in D. We can really optimize the queries much better than, yeah, than in a scripting language where you don't know what, what's being used before you query it. So you always have to get all the data. This was, this was really nice insight. And so the, the idea here is to, to present a few ideas, not just for doing simple database work, but doing like real database work where we have complete workflow. But the goal is not to write a framework for this. The goal is like to have a few designs for a library that other people can maybe turn into frameworks or yeah, make compatibility. And then it's like finding, finding the right people to actually do it. And well, writing, writing the stuff. So the talk is about those ideas or those concepts and how to solve certain problems. And I will actually start with, no, with type annotations. Um, so there's like, well, it was actually the reason why I was initially a bit skeptic about user-defined attributes. I found it like a horrible idea that everybody could define their own attributes and do whatever they want. So there's four, uh, four ORM, libraries I currently found at, at, uh, at the DAP registry. And each of them uses a completely the completely own set of UDAs for declaring or for annotating types, which is a bit of a nightmare. If you imagine like five different serialization frameworks, one for XML and one for JSON, and each of them uses different attributes, it's a nightmare. So I think that's actually a fairly simple problem. We just need to start writing a UDA package and make add reasonable, reasonable attributes for every, well, for the common domains, right? So like serialization, database, I don't know what else. Um, unit testing, for example. Um, well, develop it if it's like really good at some point, include it in Phobos and then it's standardized and people can use standardized UDAs for certain domains. 
Um, it's, it's also important to have certain domains like you cannot use just ignore because sometimes you use the same declaration, the same struct, the same model for databases and serialization, right? So that happens easily if you write a REST interface. It's kind of a bit annoying because you have attributes for talking with the database side and attributes for talking with the serialization to JSON side. That's a bit of a hassle there. But overall, I think it's a really simple problem and we should just start doing it. Mm, well, just to directly dive into relational stuff. So we'll, we'll use some sort of GitHub-related example throughout the whole talk. Um, so say you have like users and you have commits, git commits, then well the well the ID on, on GitHub at least is like the, the username and the user has an email, the user has authored many commits. That's like why you have a one-to-many relation. Um, the user has also committed very commits. There's a subtle thing in, in Git that you can be the author. One person can be the author and the other can be the actual committer. Some things, for example, if you merge. Um, and then there's an example of a many-to-many -many relation where you're having many other users following certain users and have also very fo many followers in the opposite thing. Uh, if you notice the... So the string argument, the string template argument to the attributes is actually the, the, the field name, the field name of the opposite type. So a commit has an author field, right? So, and the one-to-many authored commits just makes this relation because it's not really inferable from any naming standards or whatnot. Then, well, in, in commit you don't need attributes because it's obvious what user means, like a commit has a user, that's basically, you, yeah, that's just the un other end of the many to one thing, so you can infer this. Mm. Then, obviously, obviously this is pretty cluttered with lots of attributes that are really, well, if you add some more attributes to it, because you have more use cases, and it's like really, uh, really annoying to read. So I think it makes a lot of sense to establish conventions on how to name things. We, we do have naming conventions in D already for types and functions and arguments and variables and whatnot. So it's kind of useful, and a lot of projects made very good experience with coming up with naming conventions and then using those to get rid of a lot of annotations and metadata. So, for example, if a field in a struct is called ID, then you can use it as primary key and you don't need to attach add ID to it. Fairly simple thing. Um, the other one is a bit more confusing. It's if you have, well, if you say that types are norm named by a certain convention, so you use camel case types and whatnot, then you can easily convert the database tables where the convention is using underscores and, well, snake case, no, yeah, underscores and like lower case names. You can easily convert those back and forth. So you can convert users to a table named users. You can convert public key to a table named public keys. But you can also infer, you can also use the same naming conventions to infer certain relations. So in this example, a user has many public keys, and a public keys are, key has like one user. Um, well, by inferring, you, you just save save a lot of typing and adding a lot of yeah. But you can obviously, if you have a use case like this one, where you have where you have an unclear relation where followers and following would point to the same users, you really need to declare in detail what you mean. Then you can even infer many-to-many -many, um, relations because if you, well, because the plural is users, so you look in the other type for, oh yeah, are there is a users field, okay, then this relation belongs to users. If it's a singular field, the other, the other thing has a single user, then it's a many-to-one relation. 
So you can, yeah, you can pretty much, um, well, it scales to quite, quite some complexity for quite some, um, yeah, it reduces quite a lot of boilerplate. And for for one to one relations, it's just you have you have a single field, uh, you have a single yeah thing, single field with the name of the other type. And if you want to actually, so that's if you're in SQL land, then it means the user gets the column with the avatar ID, right? So you need an ID to refer to the other type and. If you have a one-to-one -one relation, then one of those tables gets the ID. And in this case, it's user that's getting the ID. And in avatar, you have to, um, if you want to get from an avatar you, to a user, you have to do the reverse query. You have to query for users which have this avatar ID. And if you want to do this, you, you don't have to, right? But if you want to do, go the, the backward way, you obviously have to use a type, otherwise you get a circular type nesting in each other if things are structs. Each, one, one could argue to use classes, any, uh, always use classes, but I think, um, well, I think structs have certain benefits, they're a bit, bit lightweighter and, yeah, they're a bit lightweighter and it's, if you want to like have really fast queries and a lot of rather data processing than model driven whatever architecture then classes might not be the right choice. Um, so <laughs> just just to name it right in a many to many relation you have like two tables with the types and then you have another table in the middle that does the relation between those. So there's like a table which has just two columns. One is the on the left column the user IDs on the right column you have to organization IDs and then you get the relations between which users belong to which organization. That's um, basically most about attributes. So then, then it's interesting to leverage this for something that most frameworks don't do. I mean all those attributes and concepts are really relational centric. It's like for relational database management systems, not everybody knows actually how to work with those. Um, so that's like certain experience that's necessary. But you can actually use them even for NoSQL databases for with certain restrictions. So obviously, the main point of NoSQL databases is you have you can distribute them more. Uh, more. The the reason for yeah, for their existence is really you can spread them among more servers so you have really distributed databases. You can also do this in SQL if you partition something, but this is the key thing and the key technology to, to achieve this is you don't join. If you do joins across servers, then you can't, like your performance is horrible. So all those databases don't support joins and you do this something that's completely thrown up in, in the SQL land, you denormalize all your data. You store everything in each other. So for if we go back here to this uh, GitHub example, for then if you store that in, in MongoDB, you wouldn't, you wouldn't store the user in the commit. There was like hardly a way to get back from a user to commit, uh, from a commit to a user. Well, you could just copy it in there. That's what people usually do. And then you might have just an array of all the commits for a user. Would, would make a horrible use case for, for MongoDB. Um, but well, you, really, you really just embed the data in, in other structs if you have a non-relational database. And at least to that degree, you can, really use, you can really use the attributes to also work with other databases. So, you have to you have to strike out many to many and many to one relations. You can't use those in a non-relational database, but one to one and one to many works. And so I think it really makes sense to at least grab this part and support also a few non-relational databases, like yeah, like MongoDB or Cassandra, for example. If 
you try to work with key value databases and it's getting really very limited what you can actually do, do so you can store users by ID or some, some data by ID but you can't really query a lot of them. And well, one, one key principle, it doesn't make sense to emulate relational things with Mongo or whatnot. So what people sometimes do is they store IDs of other, of other objects, of other documents in their, in their classes. So you have like users and then there's a list of object IDs to some other organizations or whatnot. And then people do multiple queries and join them in the software. And that's really horrible because it kind of explodes from the complexity so from the query complexity is like, if you have a bit more models, then you easily make, end up making dozens of queries just to get one piece of information. And so I don't think it makes sense to emulate any of those non-supported things in a database library. If people want to do it, they have to do it manually anyhow. Mm. So then, <clears throat> So then the, the most, most interesting the most interesting part to work with databases is actually coming up with a nice query syntax. We've actually iterated a few things. So the well the the, the schema here is like we'll like go up with some ideas, how some ide uh, design ideas and just look at how they behave and what the properties are and make a plus negative list and see what, what works best. Um, so the initial idea, I already said that earlier, was like using expression templates could be a nice idea because there, well, you can capture quite a lot of queries, quite a lot of, quite a lot of information in a, in a way that's very familiar with D. You can even leverage the compiler to do some type checking, to do, to do precedence, Analysis, so right here in this second example, you have like an and 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 or or, and just it would just have the natural, it would just have the natural precedence. Um, that's why you have the braces around this. You can do, well, yeah, you can do type checking, and it's it's quite a hack to get this actually working, which is really a bit ugly. So we are, we came up with this example by using polymorphic lambdas and then you can instantiate the template with a with a type that captures captures what variables are used. Um, so you can see I uh, okay I I'm querying for a commit by I'm searching for a commit by author so I need to obviously query the author and then you also do an uh, yeah then you also need to commit her and you can go on with this, but it's yeah, it's really a bit. It's really a very complex hack, and you get into quite some troublesome meta programming. Not that meta programming wouldn't be fun in, in D, but still, uh, it doesn't look like the most stable solution. And well, then there's quite some restrictions actually to expression templates in D. You can't overload short circuit operators, so like you would re have to replace this or or. With a single boolean, uh, with a single bit or, or a single bit and, which makes the analogy of using decode to write the queries all already breaking, broken. You can't overload comparison operators. You can only overload the op compare and get like some results. So it's not really usable for this. And well, you can you can find an operator for in but you can't really find an operator for like, which is a very basic SQL operator. And yeah, so it's, it kind of looks nice in the beginning, but it's very restricted and it's actually also very brittle code. So I don't think that's the right choice. Then something that a lot of other frameworks do, for example, Haskell or I think Rails also has this RL, some algebraic, algebraic relational algebra library, where they do this sort of comparison. So you have named functions for each of the operators, using obviously short names. So it doesn't read like, 
doesn't read so crappy. Um, like EQ for equal and LT for less than and LTE for less than equal and blah, blah, blah. And this just kind of works nicer. So one thing you get here, you can pass certain arguments as compile time arguments, <coughs> which previously, like in, in this template thing, you can't really get the arguments at compile time. So that's a huge, that's a huge improvement. Then, but then it like, yeah, you can query certain things, but then if you want to compose those, it really becomes ugly. It really becomes very unworkable you, well, this is just the obvious example of having no precedence, right? So like, what's the end or the or referring to? Which one has higher precedence? What works and combines with which? And if you use a normal function chain, then it's like you're doing the end on the first and the or on the second part, and this is obviously not what we wanted. There's no clear way to parenthesize this other than having nested calls or having nested things. I mean, what other frameworks are doing that they have those snippets of comparison functions. So you have like C also equals water and that's like one snippet and you can assign it to a variable and then you add in more snippets and then you can combine those with each other. So you can build it up as a variable thing. But I think it comes very unreadable quickly and it's obviously also very arcane syntax that doesn't have any relation to either SQL or decode, and that therefore it's a it's a bad candidate. Then <laughs> the the next iteration was yeah maybe maybe we should write our own string DSL our own small domain specific language that can like do the querying we can use compile time function evaluation to get the meaning of this thing to parse it and what not. And well, there's some nice examples like link Q in, in C Sharp even has compiler support and must, does very nice things. Can also be used on Aries. So maybe that's a good idea. You can, you can write more concise, concise queries. You can really, yeah, you can really write um, things, you have an operator precedence, you have natural operators, you ca can pass template com arguments as compile time, you can substitute uh, the question marks. Obviously, the question marks are, again, a problem with positional arguments, we just had it with the format, right, so it's a bit of, of a hassle to, if you have like a big query and then have positional arguments, uh, have non-positional arguments, it doesn't make sense, but uh, overall, this looks kind of promising, I would say. It's not really clear what language to use there, so some sort of SQL dialect maybe. And, well, if you expand a bit on the idea to actually use SQL, that's, that's a fairly reasonable idea. In fact, SQL, SQL is a perfect domain language for querying databases. It has been developed for that. People have a lot of experience using it. Some people don't, that's a problem for them. So they have to learn a bit of SQL, but I think it's really, really the perfect language for querying databases. And then if you think a bit more about it, then why not just pass SQL at compile time? Isn't the easiest thing to do, but it's also not that horribly complex to do. And well, if you then combine it with the type information, you get a really powerful, you get a really powerful query language that is fully typed and leverages existing knowledge of SQL and can do really complex queries if you want to, but it can also do like very simple things. So for example, if you look at the first example, you don't really need to select anything because, well, selection, selection of fields can be inferred from the from the type, I will, I'll get to this later. Um, but yeah, so I think that's, that's a really good idea. And I was very surprised, or very happily surprised to find yesterday that Quill, this library, is also using this idea, and it's like saying SQL first, and we, are, we just embrace SQL as a language and use that. Uh, if you haven't seen those strings with a Q and Double question, uh, double 
well, this QSQL thing, right? This is a here doc string in D. We have here doc string support in D, and if you would say kind of standardize on using QSQL, then you could like have at least some highlighters for the SQL code. Sorry, one question there. Uh, on a previous slide, on one of the previous um, ways how to do this, mm -hmm. there was a question about uh, Velcon, about uh, different SQL dialects. Wouldn't that be a problem here? So if you, if you are querying Postgres, are, yes. is the <laughs> more yes, complex? Uh, yes, it will be a problem. And I could, uh, well, I, I'll also say something about this later, but this is an actual SQL. It's not something you send to the database. It's a domain-specific language that you use and parse and then generate whatever query you want. So you could use this for parsing uh, this, you could use this for querying MongoDB. You could also use this to actually query arrays of structs. If you have like five arrays of struct, that makes like a perfect database without indexing. Uh, so it's like a slow database. But why, why, why shouldn't you be able to do this on this arrays as well? So you could join them. You can do inner, outer join, whatnot. You should probably require certain feature sets of your database. So. Uh, you obviously are not allowed to, to join on MongoDB. Maybe you can do, can't do a full outer join with SQLite or something. But so this comes in here a bit as, well, it's, it's always the small DB dot something, which I think of is whatever native database driver people want to use. So there's like maybe a small wrapper around for every available or supported database driver. There's a small wrapper for MongoDB, a small wrapper for Cassandra, and a small wrapper for Postgres and whatnot. And then you just use whatever DB you initialize it with the native function, and you wrap it in a small shell around that, which also would allow you to do like real native queries with whatever native database interface they have. So like db.execute, just do this without compile time checking and whatnot. And also there's, there's an ANSI SQL standard, so like really sticking close to this would make it, would make it a lot, uh, well, very feasible, I think. Maybe not sticking completely to it because it's maybe a bit awkward. I have to figure that out. Um, but Postgres uses, Postgres tries to be very ANSI SQL standard conformant, so I think that makes a good candidate. Um, whoop. So to talk a bit more about how to do selects, because there were no selects in here, if you think of this query, the last one, the rows, which just um, which just queries the commits and joins them with the with the author of the commit, right? So you get well, you get as a result maybe yeah, you have two tables and then can do this. And if you wrap the actual types that you queried, right? We we passed commit and user as types to the, to the query so that the query can actually work with our data types and knows how they are named and what types the fields are so it can do all the type checking and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, when I try to think about how you may want to build these queries programmatically, I think this, well, SQL could make sense as a domain-specific language for querying databases but it would be difficult to actually change it programmatically. And what you may want to consider, it's not like I had a lot of time to think about it, is like DB create would create an empty uh, query object and then with uh, unified function calling, you'd have like a dot from and it will add the from and dot in it, uh, inner join or you'd could pass that query to a function that will uh, fill it with the predicates and then you can build complex predicating yeah. code because there will be just be adding to the object through uh, the yeah, unified yeah. function okay. calling yeah. and then when you're done putting all of your uh, qualifications, I don't know what the SQL name for it, uh, on that object you can actually fire it to the database and yeah. this will probably make it slightly uh, mm. a more natural way to program such mm. a thing. Maybe, maybe I didn't completely get, get your proposal, but I think what you just said is a lot similar to, to this thing of 
building your queries in a certain way. I think so, and, yeah. Um, well, it's, it's an approach that very, very many frameworks take, but I think it's very limited and the code reads very horribly in the end. If you have like really bigger real world queries, it's very difficult and you need to invent some, some syntax to do joins and at some point people resort to sticking raw SQL strings in there. So I don't know, Rails does it, it's like dot join and then you put like on, on whatever thing and you need to know the names of the columns you're actually joining there and then they're swapping back to some yeah, but other syntax. I, I think D has a better chance of coming up like with a higher order of uh, mixing mm -hmm. these things together. I, I'm absolutely not a domain expert on mm -hmm. how okay. to approach databases. <laughs> well, we'll see, but there, there are a few like it's, so let's say this is the foundation. You have like raw SQL, well, like you have a SQL-like language or a SQL language which allows you to access stuff, but there are some, some niceties you can add to that. So you can, um, we'll get to that. You can infer certain joints and whatnot and do them uh, automatically, so yeah. Just to add to that, I think the the point is that uh, if you want you want to do s SQL, it's certainly possible, but uh, you will very uh, you will still find the need to have a query builder uh, because uh, often your users will want to select which fields to to query uh, and and how to search for the field, how to match, and. You need you can concatenate the SQL. It's possible, but a query builder works uh, much easier. I, I don't quite get the point here, but uh, you, I, uh, you <laughs> want, you'll, you'll want to build the SQL at runtime, depending on the needs of the user. No, I actually want to build the SQL at compile time to type check the queries. I don't think you have queries at runtime unless you have like SQL injections in your code or something. Like, it's very rare to have a runtime query that just comes out of nowhere. You really know those queries beforehand, I well, think, well, in most usage cases. And other than that, you can use the runtime querying and... Well, um, personally, in, in my ecosystem in rep reporting, we do a lot yeah. of dy dynamic generation of queries. Okay. So it's not yeah. possible to do at compile that's a true. That's a true use case. Uh, reporting makes... Yeah. But also so, ba basic search interface, basically. That's also a form but, of report reporting. But yeah, seriously, I wouldn't. I wouldn't actually write D code for generating aggregations and reports. Maybe I'm. Well, let's maybe talk later on about okay. your use case. Um, I think it's nicer to have a certain tool for <laughs> doing. Well, we'll uh, talk about that. We have we have a lot of reports in our code base, and it's like they're strings. <laughs> fixed strings, so to say, because they're like daily reports or something, but okay. Um, but the point here really is you can, well, it, 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 is, it is a query builder, right? You have a query, you have all the details, all the information that you need to execute the query, you can fill in um, variables using those named colon things, you can use template variables just by passing Runtime argument, uh, just normal variables as template arguments. You can use compile time arguments, and blah. well, I think it works out quite, quite for a while. So if you have this query which just queries all the commits and the belonging author, then there is um, here there's an alias name. I mean, this is really verbose. We we're going to reduce it a bit, but here's an, two alias names, right? So there's like the table commits is allies to a single commit and users is user. So you should be able to access user and commit for each row and then use whatever fields they have in their types. So the user had a name when we declared it earlier, that's a string. So you can access the name of the user by using our user string, right? Row, user, string, and commit message and whatnot. And it's, it's possible to, to defer the, the selection until you actually use the variables. So you can figure out, oh yeah, this guy only needs the name of the user, but it doesn't need its email address, it doesn't need anything else from the user. So you only need to query user.name from 
that you only need to query the, the name column. And the, the way this works is you wrap, you have a row which wraps like all the types. So you create this at compile time, you create a row that wraps the user and the commit and also has the field as names. And then you can use of this patch to actually just patch to the real fields of the of the types under of the underlying types and just collect collect whatever field was used at compile time. This means you need to create one type for each query. Well we'll see if that works out or not. But um, I I think it should work out. D allows you to do to create like one type for each query so it should just work out. And if not, we need to fix the compiler or whatnot. Martin, we have another question over here. Yep. Yeah, I'm highly fascinated. Actually, we do have such a system in production. Unfortunately, it's C++. So, uh, but there are like, what we do, I'm sorry, we do uh, create a lot of queries at runtime. Uh, so that's kind of a crucial thing for us. And also, what I would like to know from you, since would it be possible to generate your your types from the SQL statements in the first place? Like My types from the SQL, yeah. That that's there's the 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 SQL CPP eleven library from from Roland Bock, which happens to be my boss, but. Uh, he basically reads the SQL statements, the create table uh, statements, mm -hmm. using some script, produces C++ code, and compiles mm -hmm. the whole thing. D can do better, but this yep. turned out to be a very, very like, useful workflow. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's basically two ways about this. So you can use SQL or your database as the source of truth, or you can use your types and models as source of truth, and then you need to sync them anyhow, right? Um, maybe I, maybe there's even, maybe it's one of those use cases where you want actually frameworks for both ways, but I think it's really helpful to have the models as your source code. You can commit them, you can work on them, you can add functions to them. Um, and once you've committed them, you later run migrations to change your database. We'll get to that, but it's a very proven model for a lot of frameworks, and I think it's very interesting. Rather than having doing raw SQL changes and then having to pass many different SQL databases output um, to generate types, I think it's it's way less flexible in well, certain areas. Uh, but it has as, a good use case. As, as far as I can see from from about what we do. Uh, the the code is only a small part of the whole whole uh, company basically, and the data in the database has value on its own. So it's kind of important for us to have the create table statements and have the SQL covered independently of of whatever code is connected okay. to that. So yeah. I don't think we could go that way. Yeah, I mean, it might very well be that it doesn't fit your use case at all. So, <laughs> sorry for that, but let's talk. Maybe it's, maybe you have um, maybe there's some interesting ideas there. Um, what you couldn't do, for example, is you couldn't get a schema from MongoDB or something that isn't really a SQL database. But, yeah, well. Martin? Yeah? Hello, me again. Um, so, so far in your code, I see that, you, you know, all your tables and such, they so, are... Sorry, can you speak up a bit? Okay, uh, so so far in your code, let's say for fields, uh, the this you are using structures which are value types. How would you represent, or would it, would that mean that you are mixing reference types with the value types with the nullable fields? How that would work? Um, well, if you if you wrap the access, so like this row is a very database specific thing, right? In SQL you get, like if you use MySQL drive, the MySQL driver, you get a row of variants back. So this row is a wrapper around um, the real underlying types. It just uses them as type information mainly. But you can initialize 
the real types with them. I'll, I'll get to this later if, if you have certain use cases, but if you just want the data, you can use like the name of the types to get the static typing for the variant var and, and of no for the variant in, in the SQL query result. Okay. Does it answer your question? Oh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was, let, let's say that you have a table user and let's say that uh, user maybe has a, uh, I don't know, re reference to some, something other, it, it is a nullable. So mm -hmm. that column can contain nulls. Yes. Mm -hmm. How would you insert in that or represent? So in Rust, for example, Rust Postgres, they have the, yeah. they use optional wrapper. Yeah, yeah, sure. If, yeah, sure. If you go back to this example, um, then where do we have it? Like public key as a user. Well, I think, yeah, well, maybe you should delete public keys if they don't have a user, but um, if you don't want them, if you want them at nullable, then you just use nullable. It's in stood type cons, put nullable in front of it, and then can be null or something. So, yeah, I think that's an established pattern in some serialization libraries. And Why not just use null strings versus empty strings? Use what? No strings versus empty strings. No strings versus empty strings? With a no PTR versus empty with just a PTR but no length. Uh, I don't think I understood the question. For nullable things, for yeah. nullable, uh, well, in my own SQLite thing, I represent nulls as just having the string be null. So is null is true. But if the string is just empty, you can, is null is false, but it's still empty. It just has no length. But this is a complete user model. So it references a complete other struct. So yeah. Um, so here we are. Here we are. Um, so this this row result. You, you might think of this as a I don't know. If you're querying MongoDB, then it's some. It's just a Bison struct or some. Think of it as JSON. For as a, for example, like some databases would return JSONs so, or. A row is JSON, and then you have a view which is typed over that. And if you actually want to use the, the models below that, for example, um, yeah, you call a function on, on user, which is like notify the user about a certain commit, which is important for him. Like we had this nice use case last time, uh, somebody making a pull request, and then you want to get notified about this is your code, which is going to be changed. Um, so in that case, you need the full model because you actually want to call methods on the model and you don't know what fields are necessary and you need a real type. So in that case, you query the whole thing, you initialize the variables, you initialize the types with uh, the query results and then you let people use the real types. Does it make sense? I hope so. Um, then there's some, some nice things you can do by this way. For example, you can um, well, you can you can avoid n plus one queries, so you can. This is this is a famous problem in, in scripting languages, where you ask for an array of some models. You, I'm, you know, for example, you take all the all the DLAN organization users, you query them, and then for each of them, you actually want to show the the avatar on some web page and the the name of the user, and then you go through the loop, and in the loop you access user.avatar, which is a relation. Each user has one avatar, and then the scripting language goes back to the database and asks for the avatar. So you end up with n plus one queries, like one additional query for each user you have. And there's some ways to work around this. Like usually you have to say like, ah, give me the users and also add the avatars. So like you have to add some metadata for the frameworks to actually get both things. And by inferring what you're actually using, we could kind of automate this thing. We already know that the, the loop is going to use the, the relation. So you could, you could query both, both tables at the same time and just do, just do the join automatically here. Um, so in that case, you, you know you need like two columns, two columns from two different tables, you join them on what's their, what's their relation says. So like 
in user we know it's like avatar is the other relation. They're using IDs as primary keys, so it's like avatar ID, which contains the, the, well, the foreign key. And, well, that's quite nice without writing the join, actually. If you do the same for many-to-one relation or many-to-many -many relation, then it wouldn't make sense to join them in one query because then you get a huge result, like let's say 100, well, say you query a user and all its comments, right? So then you get paginated 30 rows and the first row would always, always be the user and the last row would be different comments. You don't want to get all this additional data here. So for those relations, you would rather query the user first and then query all the other things separately. But even that can be done with a very similar syntax if you just iterate or use use the range of related objects. So then you would issue a second query. You first have to give the database handle or whatever that is to the to the user result, so it can do an additional query later on. But the the nice thing here is because you know all all the details. You know the query, you know the well, the, the constraints, you know how it's going to be used later on. You can actually build very, very dedicated type information that are really optimal to query the data. That's very unique to D, I would say. And so that's where I see a huge opportunity to write a really nice database thing and to make working with it very pleasant, actually. Um, so, yeah. Well, in inserting shouldn't be much more complicated than just doing insert of a certain variable, uh, of a certain value, of a type. Then you might have certain certain relations which you just save with the original type. So you, I don't know, it's like not the best example, but if you have a, well, yeah, maybe if you pass like git commits, then you create a commit message and create a new user for those users that you didn't yet know, so you add the, the name and the email, and then you just save both of them because the user wasn't saved before, and then you save both in their respective columns. And those syntax where you where the query result actually has the nested names for the has nested names for the for the variables also would allow you to set certain parameters and then save save that specific type. So yep. how do you make sure in that example that ID is unique? I mean, this is usually something that is generated by the database and not by the user of the abstraction. So here you're creating a commit with an ID and you make, must make sure it's somehow that the ID is unique inside your table. Oh, it's no, yeah, yeah. So if we, I, I mean, might go back there. No, no, that's a completely reasonable choice. Uh, where was it? Here. So. Uh, well, if you have a commit struct, then you might just use the SHA-1 hash of git commits as your primary key. Okay. Uh, and if you have a normal int ID, then you can add an auto increment attribute to it, so it auto increments the ID and generates one. Okay, but then you can't use the uh, D provided default constructor for the commit anymore. I mean, if you have an auto increment to this thing assigned, you're sort of changing the key while inserting then. Um, I see what you're saying. Well, then <laughs> just don't set the ID, or I don't know, uh, or give a default value. Or, yeah, or just create your own constructor. I mean, there's certainly something you can do about it, about the problem. There's like so many tools to just get around it. I don't know, put the ID at the end of the list of fields, for example. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that might not be the best alignment or whatnot, but, um, or you generate a mix in that creates a constructor without the ID, <coughs> just to name a few solutions. Um, well, five minutes left, Martin. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, so you could like set some field on, on those return, uh, result returns, and you could, so there's some, that requires some change tracking, right? You change, uh, track like, okay, message was changed, 
And if you save, then you're writing a message to the database. If you go back to this example, you could, uh, you could change some fields on user and then do r.user.save or r.commit.save and whatnot. And this, this is a fairly nice interface for well manipulating and updating types. The other interesting thing is if you do like a full SQL thing, you can do also fully typed really complex queries. So like getting getting the average com weekly commits people are committing by having a subquery where you query from. Um, don't think so. Like it's yeah, you just group commits and users by week. Here's the and then you you build the average of commits per week. But um, here the main point is it uses two MySQL specific functions, weak and uh, standard deviation, and that's like not what you want. You would actually want a database agnostic abstraction, but you should also allow to declare such functions and also declare stored procedures so people can use them with their normal code. We'll have to figure out how to do this. Maybe as D, just declare D functions and pass them with the query or something. Um, but there's certainly a way to declare those. Then, well then the last real big topic is how, how to do migrations. How to do, because schema and data models are changing Often, if you work with some application, you have new requirements, you add new fields, you change something. And um, a fairly interesting way I came up with is, um, well, you have, you have certain functions to, to, you have certain functions to write migrations and um, to add new fields and whatnot. Using SQL for those is like really, really very verbose. And also you, you can have a certain, certain list of um, add, adding fields, adding indices, creating tables and whatnot. You could also have code in there. You need two functions, one for the forward migration, one for the backward migration, because having reversible migrations is a really nice and important feature. Um, so this one would like add two new fields, forename and surname, and then you split the name or you join them in the code and then later on you can drop the field. This is like one migration you would run to split a name into two parts. And so the nice thing is if you have a list of migrations, say they're all in a separate file in a folder called migrations, you can do some very interesting thing with, things with them. You can take all of the migrations and compute a schema that results if you apply all the migrations from a null initialized database. So you're creating all the tables, you're adding all the fields, so you have all the um, schema information. And then if you also take all your types that are part of the database, you can also compute another schema from that. And so you now have two schemas, right? One is the one that should represent your actual database by having all the migrations in there. You have another schema that results from having all your types that you're actually using. And then you can diff, diff the two. And if you edit like new fields in your types, um, you can create a migration automatically. So you can generate the code to, to, I don't know, to add a field or something. And you, you can then write it to a file, check it into Git, can add more complex things that cannot be inferred how to do then, can, edit a bit and, well, yeah, later you can check it into Git and run the migration on your database if you want to. So that's, I think, a very nice way to work with migrations. If you want to go from a library to a real framework, you probably need certain conventions to, like, auto-generate a list of all models, auto-generate a list of all migration files, and have them in separate folders so you can easily, well, Man manually maintaining a huge list of all types is like a really, really painful thing. And if you have some basic convention, then you can automate it. You could also, if you have this convention in place, you can also use migrations of dependency packages, right? So there's like user man, which is a vibe D addition to, to user management. And you have 
well, it comes with its own few tables to have like users' emails and notifications and um, or you could import the migrations from that and have your framework also run those and create those tables, even though you didn't write the code. Um, that <laughs> migration part was probably a bit fast, and I think it's also the part that's the most unclear on how to do it nicely. It's like one thing that could, could work out, but it's really, um, it's, well, it's sort of difficult to have all templated code in there. It's even a question whether you want to allow real, real decode in migrations or not, or whether you want to have more restrictive things, but I think it's kind of necessary to run real code to have migrations. Um, well, at least on the migrations, there's quite a lot of question marks on how to do it nicely. <laughs> well, uh. I'm very sorry. This is a very interesting topic for me. Uh, how would you handle transactions? Can you think on any less verbose way than, you know, transaction, be, be, begin, scope, exit, scope, uh, uh, failure, or? Um, well, first, yeah, well, first of all, I, um, you would probably use RAII for that and have like transaction begin, return something and commit later on succeeding and nulling that. Right, I, I, I just got the idea because there, it was mentioned earlier that you might, you, if there is such feature, you may know if your destructor is being run in an exception unwinding path, huh? where you could roll back. Maybe that, that could be very fun. Huh? Just an idea, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, but yeah, so DB transaction begin, or yeah, that would be also my first idea. I'm not sure if we can do it much better, but yeah. It's like synchronized in a certain way. Uh, in, in my ecosystem in uh, PHP, I use Doctrine. Uh, <clears throat> it's a bit more advanced than this, I would say. And you have a, um, a concept of identity of an entity when you load it from a database. Can you, can you also speak a so, little bit louder? Uh, uh, what about the concept of identity? So in Doctrine, you have when you load a user from the database, yep. it's one object with one reference. If you then happen to get a commit from that user via another way, and you go to the user object, yeah. the ORM makes sure you get the same object. So if you change the object, yeah. all your program knows the object has changed. Well, that seems a bit difficult with structs. Have you? Yeah, it's it's well, it's always a problem in, in if you work with databases. And don't think you can really get rid of it because you have this copy of the data from database in your memory. So, well, you can make sure you have only one copy instead of uh, yeah, five. But that's like really very intransparent, and then you have multiple threads on different connections of the database. It doesn't really pan out. But the simple no, not solution, saying it's easy, but it's 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 very convenient to, to but work the with. Uh, simple solution to this is like you do have a dot reload on your model, and then you reload this thing from the database if you are like unsure that something happened. Yeah. So, I yeah. We have time for one more question here. Oh. Uh, yeah, I think we should really c c collaborate about this stuff because with uh, these compile time <laughs> ability, you could actually do stuff like creating a, a custom database engine for all your queries and have it super optimal. Yeah. I, I reckon you yesterday mentioned compiling SQL statements on uh, in compile time. That was kind of funny. Um, yep. So I'm sorry to cut things off. We'll have to have the questions be in person to Martin, but we got to go to lunch. OK. What? Give Martin a hand. Uh, <laughs>